so a bit of an introduction to Get Cymru Buzzing. Uh, so Get Cymru Buzzing is a three-year partnership project um, run by Cumbria Wildlife Trust with a range of partners. You can see all the logos. Um, and yeah, Get Cymru Buzzing is one of Cumbria Wildlife Trust's two pollinator projects. The other is Planting for Pollinators, which is a new one. Um, it started just last year and they're building on the great work that the Get Cymru Buzzing has been doing over the past three years. Um, yeah, so it started back in 2019 and it was due to finish around now, but thankfully we're, we're still here. Um, <clears throat> and the initial aims of the project, uh, one of them was to create a, a, and or enhance 115 hectares of pollinator habitat, which it has done, uh, work with communities in North and West Cumbria in our project area. You can see the map on the, on the right hand side there, that, that's our project area there following um, the, the bee lines, um, the bee lines network as recommended in, in, in Bug Life's um, kind of framework for that. Uh, we've also been working with Cumbria Biodiversity Data Center to increase pollinator recording um, and work with volunteers to create and run a wildflower nursery that is now up and running at Gosling Syke, um, which is a Cumbria Wildlife Trust uh, site and they're growing uh, wildflowers from from scratch, native wildflowers, and so the, the aim was for these for all of these uh, these bits of work to basically help increase uh, and imp and increase local pollinator po populations in Cumbria to raise awareness and to encourage everyone to take action. Uh, as I mentioned, thankfully our project has been extended for another six months until until September. Um, so now we're currently in the final year of our project. But saying that, we've got a lot to do between now and September and lots of exciting things um, that you can get involved with. So first of all, we have Big Plant, which is essentially uh, in the first week of May, we're working with 100 community groups to run 100 community planting events, planting a total of 15,000 wildflowers in one week. Uh, the second is our Recording the Buzz, uh, which is essentially our pollinator recording efforts, which this is forming part of. We're running uh, a whole program of, of recorder training events um, on a couple of online webinars in March. Um, and this is the first in that series, uh, but we're also running loads of in-person uh, field sessions during the spring and summer. Uh, we're also working with Cumbria Biodiversity Data Centre to create a Cumbria Bumblebee Atlas and a State of Pollinators in Cumbria report. Um, we got a third area of work is focused on well-being in nature and we're running some events around that. And lastly, uh, in September, um, we are running a basically a festival of pollinators and, and it was based in Carlisle over the 22nd to the 25th that weekend. Um, and as part of that, we'll be running a national conference on pollinators, which will be hybrid, so both online and in person in Carlisle. So lots of really exciting stuff, basically. Um, and we hope to see you again at future events and future campaigns. Uh, just quickly flagging up some of our upcoming events, um, our, the, the ones coming up sooner. So as I mentioned, we have our our, our March webinar series. This is the first in that. Next Thursday, we have a follow-up Bumblebee ID webinar to this, um, where we'll be building on some of the stuff from today and, and the bits that we, that we won't be including today. So please do come along to that and please do sign up if you haven't already. And later on in March, we're also running a webinar focused on pollinator recording and how essentially your ID skills and your, your records can really help wild pollinators. And um, we've also got some other events there. And uh, yeah, all of these are bookable on the Cumbria Wildlife Trust events pages, which hopefully Carl can pop a link in the chat for. That'd be great. Thanks. Now to get started with the webinar, what you're here for. Um, <clears throat> so welcome. Yeah, welcome to this uh, webinar on Bumblebee. So you're muting me. Um, <clears throat> it's just taking a minute. If anyone, if any new folks have come into the webinar, could you please turn your video off? It's um, been a little bit slow, thank you. 
So a quick plan for the session, uh, essentially we'll be uh, going through a quick introduction uh, to kind of pollinators in the UK and, uh, and how bumblebees fit into that and a, an introduction to bumblebee ecology. We'll then go over the kind of key features for bumblebee IDs, the key bits of information that you need when you're looking at a bumblebee to find out what species it is. Um, and then hopefully at this time, we'll have a very quick break and then we'll go over each of the the eight common uh, bumblebee species and, and we'll, we'll learn how to identify them. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, how you can use your ID skills to help bumblebees through recording. And then there'll be a bit of time for questions. So what comes to mind when you think of a pollinator? Well, for a lot of people, it is honeybees. Um, <clears throat> and well, well, honeybees are almost entirely domesticated in the UK. Um, virtually every honeybee that you see out and about is lives in a managed hive that's managed by, by a beekeeper. And there are actually an incredible number of insects that can pollinate. Um, pollination can be carried out by basically any insect that travels from flower to flower um, and then moves pollen from flower to flower. And, th and this process of pollination is essential for plants. Uh, many plants as it allows them to make fruit and to reproduce. So we owe a lot to pollinators. Um, yes, and as I mentioned, there's an incredible diversity of pollinators and lots of things that you wouldn't expect are pollinators. Um, wasps, hoverflies, um, dung beetles, um, butterflies, moths, solitary bees, uh, bumblebees, all of these are really incredible wild pollinators that are so, so important. Um, and it's estimated there are over 5,000 species of insect pollinators just in Cumbria. Um, in the UK, we have 9,000 species of wasp, and that's more, that, 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 that's more than there are mammal species in the entire world, <laughs> um, which is, yeah, bonkers. Uh, and there are 270 species of bee in the UK. So it, it, it just gives you a flavor of the, of the sheer diversity that we have even in, in, in the UK and, and in Cumbria. Um, and it's so important that we do conserve this diversity because no one pollinator can, can pollinate every plant. So we need to conserve all of these species and not just, not just a couple. Um, but for the focus of today, we will be focusing on, on bumblebees. <laughs> um, but UK bees can be split into three groups, uh, honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees. Because as I mentioned, there's 270 species of bee in the UK. So the first of these, um, we have one species of honeybee, and this is, as I mentioned, um, pretty much entirely domesticated in the UK. Um, and uh, honeybees are generally pretty well cared for. They're, um, they're not declining, unlike our wild bumblebees and solitary bees. Um, and honeybees are the only uh, the only bees in the UK that actually produce honey um, and they have incredibly large uh, large hives like large colonies um, up to 100,000 bees in a hive um, and, and the reason that that honeybees produce honey unlike our other wild bees is is because they use that as or, or, or naturally would have used it as a as as a store of food during the winter months so a lot of that hive actually overwinters, um, which is a bit different to our, to our wild bees. Um, honeybees also look quite different to our, to our wild bumblebees. They're quite smooth. Um, their body's quite barrel shaped, they're stripy. Um, yeah, and they're, and they're, quite, they're quite industrious um, in, in terms of their pollen collection. They, um, yeah, they, they like to get every grain because they, they need to produce that much honey. Um, and then we have our bumblebees. So we have 24 species of bumblebee in the UK and all of these are wild. Um, bumblebees are, so 18 of these species are social bumblebees. And what I mean by that is that they create a nest um, and they have queens and workers and males. Um, and these, but then we also have six species um, of bumblebees that are called cuckoo bumblebees. And like the bird, they, um, 
they essentially kind of they don't make their own nest they they utilize the nests of other social bumblebees uh, it's very political they um they can take over <laughs> the nests of of um of other kind of social bumblebees um and uh and there's this murder in some cases as well it's very interesting and um, we won't be covering creepies in this particular webinar um but we'll be covering them next next thursday um, that's what I mean by that. So we've got 18 social species and six cuckoo species. Um, and most of these species uh, live in, in nests of kind of 50 to, to 400 bees, so much small, smaller than, than the honeybee colonies. Um, and this is dependent on the species. So some of our rarer species typically have these smaller, smaller nest sizes. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, yeah, and I'll go on to solitary bees now. <laughs> and the rest of our, our UK bees are solitary bees. Uh, and like their name suggests, um, solitary bees, they're not social. So they don't have these kind of like queens and workers and a nest structure necessarily. Each female instead kind of cares for her own young. Um, and they're incredibly diverse, both in terms of numbers, as over 250 species of them, but also in terms of uh, the way that they look. Some of them don't look anything like you'd expect a bee to look like. Um, and they have incredible, incredibly diverse nesting habits as well. Um, so there's some species that are miners, so they you know dig holes. Um, there's some species that that use hollow tubes. Like, like you get in bee hotels and use all kinds of different materials to make cells such as leaves and, and, and mud. Um, there's even one species of solitary bee that uses discarded snail, shell, uh, snail shells to lay a single egg inside. Amazing. Um, so you're really, really fascinating and incredible pollinators and very overlooked. <clears throat> but yeah. This webinar we're focusing on bumblebees, um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I personally think that they're, the, they're the perfect group to set you off on your entomological journey. Um, I, I, I'm no, but I'm no expert. Um, it, about two years ago was the first time that I learned how to to ID bumblebees. Um, when I was working with Bumblebee Conservation Trust, I got a traineeship with them, and if, uh, hopefully that will be a reassurance <laughs> to everyone here that. You, you can learn bumblebee ID in quite a short amount of time uh, if, if it takes your interest. So that it's definitely they're definitely a group to, to start with and to and to expand from. Um, and it's really helpful because there are there are eight eight species that are very common and and these are the ones that you'll see 99% of the time. So it's quite reassuring that you can you don't have to necessarily even learn all 24 of them straight away. You can focus on a smaller subset and then kind of learn as you go. Um, and another great thing about bumblebees is that they, they, they're everywhere, or at least they should be. So wherever, whenever, you know, wherever you are, wherever you're out and about, you can, you can listen, listen for and spot bumblebees. And while you're doing the spotting, you almost certainly will start to spot other things too, which is, which is really wonderful. <clears throat> Sorry, it's just taking a second. <laughs> yeah, if, if you just arrived and you don't have any, if you have your video on, could you turn it off, please? Thank you. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> Maybe someone turned the video off. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so during this presentation, I'll be talking quite a bit about cast. So I'm just gonna give a brief kind of explanation to what that is. Um, so essentially, bumblebee casts. Uh, this refers to the different roles that bumblebees have within within the nest, um, within a social bumblebee nest. So we have queens, workers and males. Um, so the queens are the the, the biggest <laughs> of the bumblebees. They they live um, they live for a year and they they essentially are the reproductive females, so the females that lay eggs and 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 also start the, the nest cycle. They're yeah, they're really quite integral to everything. Um, 
Uh, the workers are often kind of miniature versions of the queens, but they are basically sterile females. So they're, um, yeah, they aren't able to, to, to kind of, yeah. Um, and their job essentially within the, within the nest is to basically to work. And then we have the males, um, they're not around for very long, only a couple of weeks, and they don't really contribute that much. Their sole purpose in life is to mate pretty much. Um, and um, yeah, so now I'm gonna go on to the bumblebee life cycle. I think I've remembered everything there. So this is the bumblebee year. So we're gonna go into, um, into, 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 the, into the year of bumblebee, or at least the year of a bumblebee queen and a, a year of bumblebee nest. So uh, we're currently around here between these two. Um, so in, in, in the autumn and the winter, um, queen bumblebees, they hibernate, um, but only the queen bumblebees hibernate. Um, so sh she'll find uh, in the autumn, she'll find a nice kind of loose sandy soil somewhere where, where she, can, she can dig a hole. Bumblebees aren't particularly great diggers, so they'll just dig a, a, a nice kind of shallow hole um, and she'll, she'll stay there during the winter months without any resources and, and all on her own. Um, and, and then in the spring, when the temperature is, is gets, when it gets warm enough, she'll emerge. And um, as I mentioned, she didn't have any resources during the winter months, so she was relying solely on her fat resources. So when she first emerges, first thing she needs to do is feed a lot. Um, because she's, yeah, she's, 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 she, she hasn't fed for a very long time. Um, some studies have said that uh, these, these, the queen bumblebee sometimes need to feed for two weeks before they can even start considering looking, looking for a nest because they're, because they're that hungry, basically. So at this time of year right now, it's really, really important, um, the availability of, of flowers, which obviously there aren't that many flowers around at this time of year necessarily. Um, Trees and willows and shrubs can be really, really important this time of year. Um, and I believe quite a few of my colleagues <laughs> have been seeing bumblebees, the first queen bumblebees this week, which is really wonderful. So we're, we're just at the very start of this, uh, start of the spring season, which is really exciting. So hopefully if you go out in the next few days and there's some nice weather, you'll be seeing bumblebee queens. <clears throat> Um, so yes, once she's fed up, she'll start to look for a suitable nest site. Um, so what does a suitable nest site look like? Well, um, um, it depends on the, on the species. So for many, many of our bumblebees are underground nesters um, and and uh, naturally they would use discarded mammal burrows, um, mammal bur burrows with, with lots of nesting material, uh, but that's even better, they, they use it for insulation. Um, in a more kind of human context, they might use kind of man-made ca cavities uh, under your shed, in your compost bin. Um, but yes, uh, many of our species are underground kind of nesters. Any bumblebees that have the name Carda in the name, any bees that have the name Carda in the name, um, nest instead of underground, they, they nest in long grass. So they uh, essentially comb a nest, create a kind of a cup, I guess, in the, um, in the base of, of grass tussocks um, to, to create a space for their nest. Um, so as you can see here on the right, um, this here is a, let me get my laser pointer up. This here is a, a common carder bee nest. And you can see here that there's some, um, there's some kind of, uh, what do you call them? I don't know, pockets um, with, with, with this shiny liquid in them. This isn't honey, but it's a honey-like substance. Um, so as I mentioned, bumblebees don't produce honey, only honeybees produce honey. Um, and bumblebees don't, don't particularly store a lot of food, um, but they do store enough to last a couple of days in case of a bit of rainy weather. So all of these are, are basically food stores to, that, that enough to kind of cover a few days in case there was some, some bad weather. And these closed up ones are um, where the queen would lay her eggs. And um, 
<clears throat> yeah, so we have underground nesters and carder bees. And the, the odd one out of our bumblebees is the, the tree bumblebee. This is a fairly recent addition to the, to the UK bumblebee fauna. Um, it first came on the scene uh, in, early, in the early 2000s. It's not an invasive species. It's, um, it kind of naturally colonized. It's just been moving northwards um, from, from Europe but it's, um, it's doing very well. It's, it's, moving, it's moved northwards very, very quickly. I've seen plenty in Cumbria. It's well up into Scotland at this point. Um, yeah, full, full length of, of Britain, really. Um, and they're, they're naturally aerial nesters. So they would normally nest in like tree burrows, but they, they do particularly well in urban areas because they love bird boxes and other kinds of structures that we provide. Um, so yes, there you go. That there are the three different types of, of, of nesting habits that we that we see in our in our bumblebees. So back to the bumblebee year. Um, so yes, once um, once a queen has found her found her nest, she's found a suitable site. Uh, the queen will um, she'll lay her eggs. And these will develop into female workers, so the sterile female workers. Um, and then once those those workers have have sort of started to kind of develop, um, the queen will remain in the nest where she'll focus on on laying eggs. Um, and then those uh, and then during the summer months and and in the and in the late later spring, we'll be seeing lots of workers out and about. Uh, and they're busy um, foraging on flowers. So essentially collecting nectar and pollen from flowers to bring back food for their young. Um, and, and they also help to care for the, for the eggs and the, and the larvae in the, in the, in the nest as well. Um, when when the, the nest starts to reach capacity, so once, once, once the, uh, the, the queen has got, well, once the nest has got good numbers of workers, the, um, uh, the, the queen will start to she'll, she'll start to lay male eggs instead of female eggs. Um, so really interestingly, um, so essentially the, the, the queens that 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 when they emerge in the spring, they will have mated the previous autumn. So when they were a new queen, they would have mated with a male. So she has essentially during the winter months she is holding kind of fertilized eggs, and when she when she first lays her eggs to produce workers, these are fertilized eggs. But then later in the in the in the in the spring, in the in the early summer, when she wants to start laying male eggs, she'll lay unfertilized eggs because male bumblebees have half half the chromosomes, I guess, of um, of female bumblebees, which is I think is fascinating. Um, anyway, so, so she'll start to lay male eggs. And then soon after the, the males will start to emerge. Um, and hopefully by that point, um, there will be some, some new queens that have been, have been developed by the nest or by other local nests. Um, so essentially uh, workers, so female bumblebees, workers and queens, when they are first larva, they're basically exactly the same. What determines whether a female bumblebee is going to be a queen or a worker solely depends on how much she's fed when she's a larva, when she's a, when she's a grub. Um, so if she's fed not very much, she'll become a worker, which is a, a sterile female. And if she's fed lots and she gets really fat, she'll become a queen in later life. So basically, um, the ability for a nest to produce queens relies on having lots of forage nearby um, and having, so, it's, so it, yes, it's, it's really important basically that we have lots of forage because otherwise without them, we can't produce queens and without queens, we can't produce more bees. Um, <clears throat> so once the, the new queens emerge, they'll mate with those, with those males. Um, and then, um, and then those, the, those, those queens will either decide depending what, when it is in the year to go, to go into hibernation or possibly in some species, they might decide to do another nest cycle within the year. Um, but there you go, that's the bumblebee year. So we're gonna have a quick quiz now, um, if we can get the polls to cooperate. So we're just gonna ask you a question. Oh, thank you, Carl. 
And essentially it's, which is the only bumblebee cast that hibernates and starts the nest in the spring? So which is the only bumblebee cast that, that overwinters and uh, starts the nest in the spring? We'll give you, um, I don't know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Oh, um, then I think that I think there might be multiple questions in there, but just answer the first one, I think. Yeah, okay, okay, can you do that, Carl? I don't know. If anyone's having any issues, pop it in the chat and we'll try and pick it up. I haven't seen any responses yet, Carl, have you? Ooh. Oh, people are writing in the, in the chat. Don't look. Um, yeah, I think people are saying that the poll isn't working, unfortunately, Carl. Um, I'll, I'll, end the, I'll end the poll, okay. Um, anyway, lots of you were saying in the chat queen, which is the, which is the correct, which is the correct answer. So fantastic. Um, yes, so the, the, essentially the queen is, queen bumblebees are so important because basically the start and the, the end of the, the nest cycle relies solely and only on her basically. Um, a, a queen is the only, is the only kind of means to, to creating a nest. So really important. <clears throat> so now we're going to go over some of the features to help you kind of differentiate bumblebees. Um, the different features that can help you tell what, what species of bumblebee you have. Um, but before we can do that, we need to make sure that we actually have a bumblebee because, well, because bees have stingers and flies don't, a lot of flies like to pretend that they are bumblebees or they're bees so that they, the less likely to get predated on. And there are some really amazing bee mimics out there. Here's just two examples. Um, so on the left here, we have the bumblebee hoverfly, which is an incredible mimic, really, really good. <laughs> and, um, and on the right here, we have a dark edge bee fly, which is basically the common bee fly species. These are, uh, well, bee flies in general are, are pretty kind of early spring species. Um, and, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing them in the next few weeks. They're really, they're really quite special, <laughs> and they're, they're, they're so cute, <laughs> and they're very, very, um, and they are very fluffy, like like bumblebees. But as you can see, they have this um, this kind of long proboscis. There's this long tongue, which kind of is, is permanently out pretty much. And um, yeah, and, and and this is something that we don't really see in, in bees, so it's a good indicator that you've that you've got a bee fly. And, and not a bumblebee. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the big giveaway with, um, with flies, to, to know that you've got a fly rather than a bumblebee is, is the eyes really. So in, um, in bumblebees, they typically have smaller eyes. I mean, in this picture on the left, it does look like they have fairly big eyes, but they're kind of, they're long and thin, they're on the side of the head. And they don't take up the full, they, they don't take up that much area on the face, on the head. Uh, whereas if we compare it to the, the fly on the right, you can see it's got absolutely massive eyes. They just cover its whole face. Um, so if you see anything with, with big eyes like that, you, you can be pretty sure that it's probably going to be a fly. So another quick quiz. Do we think that this is a fly or a bumblebee? Based on, based on that, based on... If we can't get the poll to work, maybe we could just do it in the chat. Everyone can throw in their answers. Mm, yes, yes. Fantastic, I'm getting lots of answers for fly. Yeah, fly, big eyes, exactly. Um, oh, it's all right, Carl, we'll, yeah, we'll leave the poll. <laughs> we'll, we'll give up with that. Um, yes, fly, exactly. So it's, um, as you, as you rightly said, big eyes. Um, and also flies have one set of wings. 
Um, so one, one wing on either side, whereas bumblebees have two sets of wings. Um, so that, that's, that's another good feature to watch out for. Um, and another, another feature is, is, is the antennae. So uh, bumblebees ha often have these kind of longer antennae which extend out from the, the head, but whereas in this fly, they, they don't really have that. They have these little plumes, I guess, of uh, stuff going on there, but it's, yeah, it, it doesn't look like a bumblebee in terms of its antennae. Um, so you're fairly happy that you've got a bumblebee. Well, there are 24 species of bumblebee in the UK. Um, we have our eight common species, which we'll be going over today. We also have eight rare species, uh, which are listed here. And there are also six species of cuckoo bumblebee, which I mentioned before. Um, in our next webinar next Thursday, we'll be going over some of the rare bumblebee species that you might see in Cumbria, and we'll be going over the cuckoo bumblebees as well. Um, just, just in case any of you are counting this up, uh, there's 22 here. There are another two bumblebee species which make up up to 24. Um, but the, those two are, the, are basically the species within the white-tailed bumblebee complex. So basically you can't really tell them that easily apart in the field. It's more genetic um, differences in some cases. So we haven't included them here. Um, but yeah, just so you're aware in case you're counting up. Um, yeah, essentially we're going to be focusing on the big eight in this, in this webinar. And 95% of the time, 99% of the time, if you see a bumblebee, it's going to be one of these eight. These are generalist species that you find in gardens, green spaces, urban areas, everywhere. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's just basically you're very likely to, to see these species and you're not very likely to see the rare species unless you're in good bumblebee habitat or you're in within the range of distribution of those species. Um, and or if you're in an area where there's lots of bumblebees, possibly you might see cuckoo bumblebees because generally they're a good indicator of where there's lots of bumblebees because they're essentially parasitizing other species. Um, but yes, essentially most of the time, pretty much almost always going to be seeing these species. So it's a really great place to start when it comes to bumblebee ID because it's just a nice small group, isn't it? Um, I'm just going to flag up um, some terms here. So for the different body parts of a bumblebee, um, because I might be using them quite a bit in this in this webinar. So as I mentioned, antennae um, to these things at the front. Um, the tongue or the proboscis, proboscis, I'm not saying that right, proboscis, script. Anyway, uh, the tongue um, is, yeah, which, which can be very important uh, and, and quite variable in bumblebees. Uh, head, thorax is this first kind of part of the body here. And then you have the abdomen, which is the lower part of the body, uh, tail, pollen, basket, wing. Um, but yeah, the thorax and the abdomen are the two key terms that might be a bit new to some people and sometimes I get them mixed up. So um, yeah, it's just good to be aware of them as we go. Um, so yes, we're gonna be talking about the different ID features. Uh, and the first one, the, 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 the great place to start with with bumblebees is, is tail color. Um, just so I'm, yeah, just for clarity. So these are the eight, the, common, the big eight. There are some, for some of these species, there are two images. Um, that's, that, that's because it, it's just showing the kind of difference between the males and the, and the, and the queens. So just, just ignore that, just, um, yeah, there's the, the eight species here. Um, so we'll be, yeah, so the, 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 the first ID feature to really focus on is, is tail color. This is a great way to start to, to, to kind of uh, reduce your options and figure out what, what species you might have in front of you. So we can group by tail color. As you can see here, um, we have five, species, five common species of white tail bumblebees or bumblebees with white tails. We have two common species um, of bumblebees with, with red tails and only one with a ginger tail or a kind of uniform color. So already, if you're seeing, <laughs> If you're seeing, um, say, a ginger bumblebee out and about, it's pretty much almost, almost certainly going to be a common carder. 
Um, there are some other Carda B species that are ginger, but they're much rarer. So already you're you're really limiting um, your options, which is really fantastic, and it, it means you can get you can get close to ID quite quickly. Um, I mean, saying that um, a good a good a good ID uh, a good good bumble ID ID a good ID in general always eliminates all other options. But at least when you're starting out and you're learning, obviously it's nice to to um, just to feel comfortable in in yeah in, in narrowing it down to something quite quickly and easily. Um, but yes, essentially, tail color is a really great way to, to start. So if you're going to be paying attention to a bumblebee and you want to try an idea, find, get, get its tail color, check it straight away, first priority. Um, next thing is banding. So this is another great way to reduce down your options and the next feature you should look at. So when I say banding, I'm meaning the, the kind of pattern of the bumblebee, so the color, uh, the placement, and the number of bands. On its, on its body, on its abdomen, on its thorax and its abdomen. Um, so for now, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna use this example with the white-tailed bumblebees and we're gonna uh, narrow down with them. So <clears throat> yeah, as, as we said, we have five common white-tailed um, bumblebees with white tails, um, but we can narrow that down again, just by looking at the bands. So only two species of common but bumblebees with white tails that have two yellow bands. So essentially, if you see a bumblebee that has um, if it has one yellow band on its collar and then one yellow band on its abdomen, then it's pr pretty much going to be one of these two species: um, the white tail, the buff tail bumblebee. If you see a bumblebee that has uh, a white tail and has three yellow bands, it's one of these two. Um, when I say three yellow bands. Uh, understandably that, that can be a bit confusing because it doesn't necessarily look like that. Um, but we we describe three yellow bands as essentially when there's this yellow band on the collar and there's a yellow band at the base of the thorax and then there's a yellow band at the top of the abdomen. Um, and there's only two species of common social bumblebees that, that have this. So again, it's, it's a great way to narrow down your options very quickly. And then the last one, which justifies all, <laughs> it, um, it's in its own little cat category. Um, so if you have a, a bumblebee with a white tail and it doesn't really have any yellow banding going on, it's just got a brown thorax, no banding, then you, you can pretty much be certain it's a tree bumblebee. So even just by focusing on tail color and banding, just, just the color of it and the pattern of it, you can get down to species with a lot of these species, with a lot of these, species level with a lot of these species, um, yeah, with just the, those two features, which is really fantastic. And if you don't get to species level, you're very nearly there. <laughs> so quick quiz time. Um, basically, you've seen this bumblebee on the, on the, on the right, on your travels when you're out and about, uh, and I'm gonna task you with trying to identify it based on its tail color and its banding, uh, it's, it, it's, it's the color of its body. So <laughs> we'll try the fall again, but I don't know if this is gonna cooperate. Um, but if not, pop it in the chat. It, it, it's one of these five options on the slide. We'll, we'll, try, tail. we'll, try. we'll try, yeah. I haven't seen anyone using it yet. It's saying 0% on, on all of it. No, they're not uh, yeah. We've got answers in the chat. Oh, people are people are going. <laughs> people are doing it. This is great. Thank you. Oh yeah, great. Good job, everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Tree bumblebee. Very nice. Good job, everyone. First idea of the of the evening. <laughs> well done. Uh, queen bumblebees are, are are the biggest of of the casts. As you can see, they're absolutely huge. Um, and worker bumblebees, the, the sterile females, are, are very are very variable in their, in their size. And as I mentioned before, this is this is because uh, female bumblebees, so both workers and queens, when they're in their larval form, um, how much they're fed in their larval form, like it depend it, 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 it that determines whether or not they're going to be a worker or a queen. But it also kind of determines their size a bit as well. So you kind of have this spectrum, if you like, from the tiny tiny workers. And then it'll go all the way up, and then eventually it'll, they'll become queens. 
Um, and also the, the males are pretty diddy too. As you can see here on the on the on the right, which is a, a mating pair of uh, a red tails. Um, yeah, so the queens are the reproductive females, so they lay all the all the eggs in a nest. Um, in terms of behaviour, they're often um, they're often quite slow flying. They're basically they're machines. That they're huge and they can and they have this low droning buzzing. So often you can hear a, a queen or you can see it fly past and you know it's a queen because it's just so, it's so loud and big and yeah. Um, <laughs> so sometimes I, I find it really difficult to, when, when I'm listening for bumblebees and trying to find them in the field to differentiate between bumblebees and machinery from, from a distance away because <laughs> they, they, they do have a very similar sound. Um, uh, another behavior that's, that's quite indicative of, of um, of queen bumblebees is nest searching behavior. So essentially they do this behavior where they, they, they fly quite low and they're investigating holes. So they'll, they'll kind of fly in this swooping, um, kind of scanning uh, uh, motion uh, when they're looking for, for suitable nest sites. That's also quite indicative. If you see that, it's, it's quite likely that you've, that you've got a, um, You've got a queen if 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 other, if other features line up. Um, as I mentioned, the workers they are basically sterile females, um, and they're 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 basically always working. They're, they're busy. They're on the move. They're, they're fast, which is quite different to the to the queens, really. Um, yeah. So in terms of behaviour, even though some of their features, because they are female, can be can be a little bit similar to to the, the queens, um, yeah, they, they behave in quite a different way, really. Um, yeah, so they're always on the move. They're always kind of foraging on flowers. They're collecting nectar and pollen. They're, they're serving, the, serving the nest um, and, and raising the young. And last, we have males. <laughs> so typically, these um, males emerge later in the year. They're, they're the last cast to, um, in, the, in the nest, in the nest cycle, really. Um, in some species, in some of the earlier species, you might be seeing males in late May and June, um, or in early years in terms of weather, you might see them, see other species at that time, or see them a bit earlier. Uh, generally, males are kind of fluffy, they're scruffy, um, and they are generally a bit more hairy and a bit more fluffy than are the queens and the, and the workers, and that's because they don't really help out with the nest, to be honest. So they get kicked out as soon as they're as soon as they're big enough, and they have to sleep rough, and they have to stay warm on those cold summer nights, uh, and you know sleep under flowers and stuff like that. So they're a bit a bit fluffier um, to kind of cater to that. And in their short lifespan, they, they only they're only about for a couple of weeks. They they don't really do very much. They're quite lazy. Their only purpose really is to is to try and find a queen to mate with. Um, some key, some key kind of identifiers. So you can see this, this, um, this male white-tailed bumblebee here on the right. Quite a few of them have um, have yellow facial hair. They have yellow mustaches. That's quite a common feature in quite a few species. Um, so if you see a bumblebee with a yellow mustache, it, it's a good chance that it's a male. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a good ID feature. Um, and male bumblebees can't sting. Uh, they don't have the apparatus, basically. Um, so the, the stinger, uh, in evolutionary terms, it used to be a long time ago an ovipositor, so it used to deposit eggs. Um, so males have never had that, never had the right bits and pieces, really. Um, another myth as well is you often hear that the people say that bees, in the, in the general sense, um, can only sting once. Um, but, but that's actually only worker honeybees. So worker honeybees have barbs in their sting, but, um, but queens and, and queen honeybees and queen and worker bumblebees, et cetera, they, they don't have those barbs. They, they, they could sting as many times as they like hypothetically, but they don't because they're lovely. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the, as I mentioned before, um, we have the, the tail color and the banding, so that those are the two first features that you need to look at, and that will go a long way in terms of your identification. Um, 
but when you start to consider cast, because it is important in terms of ID, um, you, you start to look at a couple of other features and the, the, the next feature to really look at is the hind leg. So, and it's the, it's the shape of the hind leg really. And now this is really tricky, um, honestly it is. It's probably one of the trickiest parts when you're starting Bumblebee ID, but it's one to try and start looking for and trying to, trying to kind of get an eye in for, because um, it's, it's, it's really helpful for, for lots of, yeah, for lots of ID. Um, so, there we are. So <laughs> on, the, on the left here, we have a, a female leg. And on the right here, we have a male leg. Um, so as you can see, they are slightly different shapes, at least in this, this first segment here. So the female leg is kind of a bit more, I guess, triangular shaped. It's got this real point here. Um, it's a real shiny triangle, um, really smooth surface where, they, um, where the females, so both the queens and the workers stick pollen. So that's where they, they, they collect pollen and they put it on their leg. Um, the males have more of a kind of a teardrop shape leg. Um, so it kind of has this, it doesn't have this, um, it doesn't have this corner here in the same way that the, the females do. Uh, it's kind of a bit more of a teardrop and it's not as shiny in most cases. As you can see in this, in this diagram here, it's kind of got some bristles. Um, so yeah, tight, maybe it has some tiny hairs, but yeah, it, it basically it's because the males don't, they don't really contribute. They're not. Um, they're not. <laughs> they're not having to collect um, pollen for the nest. So they, they, they don't. They they don't need to have pollen baskets. They don't need to have this smooth surface on the legs. Um, another another good feature um, to look at as well as there's the hairs on the legs. So um, uh, get, get them again. Laser pointer again. So these. Um, on the female leg, these, these hairs kind of cup the pollen basket like around the leg, so they, they kind of helping to hold the pollen in essentially. Um, whereas in the males, it looks a little bit, it, it's not quite as cupping. And they also often have this kind of, this spur, I guess, um, coming out here and that's, and that, that's quite a good feature too. Um, just for, yes, as I mentioned, uh, shiny triangles in female, and this is where they stick their, stick their pollen. Um, but just for reference, uh, on the right here, we have the cuckoo bumblebee legs. As I mentioned, we're not going into cuckoo bumblebees in this webinar, we're sticking to the, to the common eight, uh, the big eight, but just, just for reference, just in case you do see anything, um, cuckoo bumblebees have very, very hairy legs. And this is because they, they really, really do, do not collect pollen. Uh, even the females do not collect pollen on their legs because they um, because of their lifestyle, they pretty much exploit um, social bumblebee nests. So they, yeah, so they basically evolved to, to not have those, to not have those smooth legs for, for pollen collection. So it, it, it's worth, it, it's worth noting that if you see a, a bumblebee with really hairy legs, it could be a cuckoo bumblebee. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yes, as I mentioned, the, the hind leg um, in females, uh, the, the workers and the queens, they, they use this to collect pollen. Um, if you see a pollen basket on, on, on the hind leg of a bumblebee, you can, you can be pretty certain that it's, well, you can be certain that it's a, it's a female social bumblebee of some kind, either a queen or a worker. So it's a great thing to watch out for because it gives you an answer very quickly. So oh, another quick quiz. Um, both of these images here, both of these bumblebees, are either male or female. So do you think they're male or do you think they're female? Go in the chat. Oh uh, yeah, we're getting lots of lots of lots of answers. Good, good. Um, yeah, I think I think I think everyone said female, which is correct. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. So um, yeah, so on the um, 
on the left here, we have a lovely shiny triangle on this particular hind leg of this queen white-tailed bumblebee. Um, so she hasn't got any pollen on there at the moment, but she probably will do soon, or she might have just... Um, yeah, so she, she, has, she hasn't got a pollen basket at the moment, but she's got a lovely sh shiny triangle, which makes, makes you think immediately, yes, good uh, female. Um, and then here on the, on the, on the right, we have uh, a worker buff or white-tailed bumblebee. We can't tell the difference between um, the workers in buff and white-tailed bumblebees. We'll go on to that later. Um, but yes, there's a, th th this particular worker's got a massive pollen basket, which definitely makes you think female straight away. So yeah, really good job, everyone. And it is, it, it, honestly, it is really tricky, the, the leg stuff. It, like, a, yeah, in terms of the shape of it, it's, um, it, it is really tricky, but it's, it, it's worth trying to, trying to pay attention to it because it's, uh, it's a really good feature. Um, so the last, um, well, the, the next feature to kind of, that is worth paying, paying note to is the face. Um, so some of our male bumblebee species have yellow moustaches. They have yellow facial hair, as I mentioned. So here we have a, a male red-tailed bumblebee, lovely yellow moustache. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's worth paying attention to that because it can give you quite a nice answer and nice indication that you're looking at a male and then you can look at those other features, try and look at the leg and it can help to build that picture. Um, Another, another good feature with the face as well is that and you can if you take a picture of, of the face of a bumblebee, you might be able to also see the antennae. And um, this, is a, this is very tricky to see, but male bumblebees also have slightly longer antennae than females. So they have, um, male bumblebees have 13 antennal segments, segments, whereas female bumblebees have 12. And because as we saw earlier, male bumblebees are typically smaller, it often looks, their antennae often look disproportionately big um, to, their, to their size. So yeah, essentially male bumblebees often have longer antennae. They're also often, um, uh, often you can see kind of elbows as well. That's also another feature that can help to determine, determine cast as well. <clears throat> um, and one last thing with the, with the face shape, there is, there are two species in particular that looking at faces is really important to tell them apart. So here we have the, the garden and the heath bumblebee. So these are the two species of bumblebees of white tails that have three yellow bands. And basically in terms of their bodies, they look pretty similar, um, you know, at least in terms of their kind of their coloration, their, their, their markings. But when you look at their faces, they're very different. So it's really worth taking a look at that angle. So in the garden bumblebee, they have a long horsey face, as you can see in the, in the photo on the left. Um, whereas the heath bumblebee has like a fairly normal, short bumblebee face. Um, the garden bumblebee has a really long tongue, hence, uh, and which it houses inside that, that, that horsey face. Um, it's, its tongue is as long as its body. Um, yeah, really amazing. Um, but yes, it's, it's worth paying attention to face as well for that reason. 